Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day uh, to you. God bless you. Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word, chapter 21, the great book of Proverbs. Proverbs giving you examples of the good and the bad, and the choice is always yours. Father never forces anyone to believe a certain thing. In other words, it is his plan that everybody make their own mind up. You sell your own vessel and uh, she's yours to set the course, whether it's true or on the rocks. It's, it's all your baby, okay? But our Father does advise, and He loves us enough that He gives us these Proverbs, which gives, gives you a choice between that that is right and that that is wrong. Chapter 21, verse 1, that word of wisdom from our Father, and verse 1 reads, this has to do with personal character. You might think of that as we go through these Proverbs. Verse 1 reads, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, he turneth it whithersoever he will. Now, uh, this should remind you of uh, Romans chapter 13, where it says there is no one in power except God hath ordained it. And Father allows both the good and the bad leaders and of course he told us, did he not, in the great book of Isaiah that in the end times we would have leaders that had babies' minds. And sometimes uh, it gives one um, a thought and, and to ponder. But our fathers, he, he says that the king's mind is in the hand of the Lord. Now it's important as the rivers, uh, waters, as the rivers of water, the word rivers is peleg, which means to divide, and it's an irrigation channel that the farmer that's irrigating can make that water go wherever he wants to, okay? Down whichever row, whatever way, and therefore you see God able to intercede in a king's mind at any time he so chooses according to peleg, which is, uh, which the word in the Hebrew means to divide, to make the water go where the husbandman or farmer would have it go. God is in control. That's why it's probably a good idea if you want his blessings, you listen to him, because he will always give you the correct path if you love him and if you follow him. Verse two, every way of a man is right in his own eyes. Can't do any wrong, gonna do it right every time, but the Lord pondereth the hearts. In other words, the Lord measures and um, equalizes and uh, smooths things out. He ponders and, and considers and considers the individual. But a man, when he judges his own way, he can overlook a lot of faults on his own part rather than being honest with himself. But God always catches it. Got it? Verse 3, to do justice and judgment is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. And, and uh, this is very true. Father makes it very clear in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, I don't want your burnt offerings, your sacrifices. I want your love. That's what our Father wants, is justice and judgment among His children. That's more acceptable. As a matter of fact, if you do not follow Him, He doesn't want your sacrifice. Okay. And, uh, and will not tolerate it. And what does that mean? What follows is there's no blessings. So you always want to be pleasing to the Father. Okay, verse four. A high look and a proud heart and the plowing of the wicked is sin. In other words, um, a high look and a proud heart is being haughty. Okay, and, and um, it, it's like, uh, tilling the ground, here we have another agriculture term again, it's like tilling the ground, planting wicked seed because you're going to harvest what you plant and what you sow. So if you sow wicked and if you sow sin, 
That's what you're going to reap. But, uh, and, and what causes this? A high look, a haughty person that thinks they can do no wrong and that uh, many times uh, have doubts that the Father even exists, that there's no justice or judgment. Oh, do I assure you there is. And our Father, just as the prior verse stated, He meets it out. He measures it. He ponders it. He takes note. As a matter of fact, he keeps notes. They're right called in the book of life. I don't know. How's your personal character doing? Think about it. Uh, you sure don't want to be proud and haughty. That's what brought Satan down in the first earth age. Verse 5. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteous, but of every one that is hasty only to want. In other words, those that think something out diligently have an advantage because they plan well and they prepare well. They think through. They don't, and he that hastily just jumps into it and rips and tears, um, he's going to want. In other words, everything he starts to do is going to flunk out ultimately. So diligently and thought means to think. And to think on what? To think on God's Word to think uh, concerning the instructions that Almighty God gives us. And always evaluate yourself, okay, as best you can. And um, if things seem to go a little wrong, you might take inventory. And you might find out for yourself and save yourself a lot of um, trouble. Excessive haste is waste. Okay, verse 6. The getting of treasures by a lying tongue is a vanity, not empty. Toss to and fro of them that seek death. Um, and, um, it's, uh, that, and so it is. Ruin uh, those who uh, agree with uh, a lying tongue, even. All it does is brings trouble. Uh, trouble right and trouble left, and so it is. How precious our Father's Word is that, uh, that uh, you can avoid those things. How? By listening to your Father. Verse 7, The robbery of the wicked shall destroy them, or I like to say the violence of the wicked shall destroy them, because they refuse to do judgment. They refuse to do what's right, even though it might be easier, even though it might be more convenient. The, the uh, violent just uh, uh, can't help being wicked, and that wickedness destroys. Why? Well, like it said back in that prior verse, God takes inventory. God measures. Uh, God pondereth. And he keeps it right down there in the book of life. The whole record. I don't know, how is your personal character doing? Verse 8. The way of man is forward and strange. Um, but as for the pure, his work is right. In, in other words, um, a froward person, his work is crooked. Okay. It's always going to be crooked. Why? He cheats, he lies, he steals. You can't trust him, and he's laden with sin. But one that you can always count on his word as a good name, and if he gives you your word, you can trust it as being, to the best of his ability, true, then you're doing good. It's always right. And uh, what's important is, is when God sees this and he ponders it, as we stated, that brings forth his blessings. Verse 9, It is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. And I'll say that goes either way for woman or man. It was the customary at this time that the the watchman's was at the top of the house, but also in the east at this time, people would walk on the house, so there was a wall there that would protect them, and they could walk to and fro on the rooftop. And what it's saying is better than uh, fighting or arguing, it's better to be out of there, okay? But that's whether it's male or female, don't, you know, uh, life is too short and the family you have chosen is the people you love. It was your choice. So communicate 
work out problems. You know, most problems are caused, or that argument, that argumentative or brawling is caused by lack of communication, by people misunderstanding, again, like I've stated prior, that a little bitty thing turns into a mountain. If you don't communicate about it, it leaves doubt, causes suspicion, and yet just, just a little bit of communication could solve it, and everything would be just dandy fine. But it's still better to walk away than it is to fight, okay, with, with, the, with your mate or family, okay, until people cool down a little bit and reason comes back. Verse 10, the soul of the wicked desireth evil. I mean, they, they, they lust for it. His neighbor findeth no favor in his eyes. His neighbor doesn't trust him. Okay. Your neighbor kind of watches your back. Uh, he did back then, and he does yet to this day. Uh, if you happen to be away from home and someone's breaking and entering, if you've got a good neighbor, he's going to watch and he's going to call the authorities or, or um, get help and take care of business. Okay, But the soul of a wicked desires evil. His neighbor's not going to find any favor whatsoever with that person. Not going to help him. You, in, in other words, you can't help someone like that. Whatever you attempt to do, it's going to be turned on you. Verse 11, when the scorner is punished, the simple is made wise. And when the wise is instructed, he receiveth knowledge. In other words, when you punish, when you punish a scorner, it may not do him any good. He may be right back at the same thing. But a common person is going to observe this punishment and see that crime doesn't pay. Don't need any of that. And whether it helps the scorner or not, and usually if it's uh, as, as the sin deepens or as the crime graduates, uh, the, so should the punishment, whereby pretty soon he gets the idea that um, he cannot uh, survive and be a scorner, and, but, but a, a, this is one of the good things about good discipline and correction. Others see and fear, and these things cease to happen among you. But a wise person is instructed and avoids anything of that nature coming out the gate. Verse 12, the righteous man wisely considereth the house of the wicked, but God overthroweth the wicked for their wickedness. Now, I, I want you to notice something here that um, the word man and the word but is, is in italics. So it means it's been added. So let's go back to the Hebrew, if we may, and because this doesn't make sense. Okay. So, and let's read it like it should be read. The righteous one, which is our heavenly Father, wisely consider at the house of the wicked. In other words, uh, God um, pondereth. Okay. He takes note. And God overthroweth the wicked for their wickedness. He's going to see to it. The righteous one keeps a record. He observes the wicked. And, um, and um, he overthrows them. Anything they head out to do is going to fail sooner or later. <clears throat> and within the getting, they're never going to have any rest anyway. Peace of mind is so valuable to good health whereby you can sleep at night with a clear conscience, knowing you've served God and your family well, and uh, God's blessings are upon you. So uh, I hope you understand the, the righteous one, our Heavenly Father, He does consider it the house of the wicked, and He overthrows the wicked for their wickedness. Why does He do it? Because they're wicked. They deserve it, and He's going to see to it. You have to understand our Father has emotions and feelings, and He has a lot of children. And when people wickedly begin to abuse those children, He's going to act. He's going to put a stop to it. Okay. Verse 13, 
Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. Now here again, this is, there are about five words translated from the Hebrew to one English word, poor. Okay. And you have to go back to the Hebrew to understand what's being said, or this wouldn't make any sense to you. I'll read it again. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the poor, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. It just doesn't make sense. Okay. Now, let's understand what this word poor is. It's dal in the Hebrew tongue. D-A-L. And what does it mean? It means handicapped. It means weak. Somebody that dangles, that, uh, that needs help physically. So, and, and you must never connect laziness with a handicapped person, okay? It just, it won't fly. So now let's read it like it should be read. Whoso stoppeth his ears at the cry of the handicapped person, he also shall cry himself, but shall not be heard. In other words, God's not going to answer him. You know, it, uh, God expects us to take care of those that need help. Um, and and, and I, I know that some people take advantage of this. You may be driving along and you've seen the same old boy standing on this corner for 13 weeks. Hey, you know, I need food and I need a job and I need this. He, some way or another, he's turning down the jobs because he was there for 13 weeks. Not working. He must be doing pretty good on that corner because he looks healthy, looks uh, plump. He's do, doing pretty good. Now, he's not handicapped, regardless of what he might say. Okay. That, that's, I mean, he looks healthy. So why I'm adding this is don't ever be taken advantage of. But in all honesty, do watch out for the handicapped. Okay. God expects it. He truly does. Verse 14. A gift in secret pacifieth anger and a reward in the bosom, strong wrath. Well, now, here again, doesn't make sense, does it? Well, the reason it doesn't make sense is it's misinterpreted. Okay. The word reward should be translated bribe. Okay. Now, let's read it again with the correct Hebrew translation. A gift in secret pacifieth anger. It's nice to... You know, if somebody deserves something, to give them a little extra bonus, you know, a, a pat on the back or a, a, a day's help or whatever the case might be. And a bribe in the bosom, strong wrath. Every, everybody, uh, you try to bribe a judge and see what kind of wrath comes forth if he's an honest judge. Boy, are you going to get it. Okay. Uh, any, anyone that takes a bribe or gives a bribe is just no good. Okay, it's just not the way to do business. Okay, it's crooked. God keeps record. It's in the book of life, and it brings forth wrath. It brings forth much trouble. Okay, but yet at the same time, a gift that um, pacifieth—that is, if you can help someone, don't only expect credit for it. Do it. Okay, fifteen. If they deserve it, fifteen. It is joy to the just to do judgment, but destruction shall be to the workers of iniquity. And so it is. God loves justice. And what is justice? It's to justify what you do and do it right. But workers of sin, destruction follows them. Hey, look at the families you know that practice wickedness. And, and, and look at, just study them a moment. It's a sad situation, okay? But boy, if you were to ask one of them, they'll cry and God doesn't help them and nobody else does. But they bring it on themselves. Wickedness, wickedness, wickedness. Iniquity, iniquity. 16. The man that wanteth, wantereth rather, out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. Boy, there is a lot in that verse, and you've got to understand it because it has a great deal to do with the end times, okay? 
because the word dead here is not like nikos or nikos in the Greek. It's raphium. Okay. It means fallen angels that are already dead that are coming back with Satan when he comes out as Antichrist. Okay. So now let's, in, in other words, if, uh, let's read it again and let's, let's uh, understand. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding, that means he, he gets away from God's word, shall remain in the congregation with the raphium, the fallen ones. How, then who would he be worshiping? Antichrist. Okay. The raphium will not be here now until the Antichrist and they are cast out of, of the heavens and reign on earth as Antichrist. What he's saying, you're going to be, if you get out of the way of God's true plan, you're going to end up in that congregation deceived. This is where the rapture doctrine takes you. Right there with the raphium. We've come to carry you away. And boy, will they be happy to. What a true statement. And what depth. Verse 17. He that loveth pleasure shall be a poor man. And he that loveth wine and oil shall not be rich. In other, in other words, if you're a good time Charlie and that's all you ever think about is celebrate, 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 you're going nowhere. Okay, You're, you're going to lose everything you got. It's not that you're not to have recreation and enjoy your life, but if that's all you think about, you're never going to acquire anything. Okay, Verse 18, The wicked shall be a ransom for the righteous and the transgressors for the upright, how they would like to change places. But um, the wicked will do be paid as the wicked shall be, and the righteous shall be paid as righteous should be by God's judgment. Why? Back to verse um, 2, God pondereth and measures the ways. Verse 19, how's your personal character doing, friends? It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. In other words, you'd be better in the Hebrew out in the dry desert than you would with a contentious and an angry woman. And, and I'll reverse it the same way that with a man. If a woman, uh, how you'd be better off out in the wilderness than you would with some old boy that's contentious and angry all the time. Okay? So... Um, there you have it. That just kind of is, um, again, I have to say, communicate. Okay. There, number one, there's a reason the person is angry, unless they are habitually so. Find the reason, communicate, and have it done with. Okay. 20. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. I mean, nothing. he can't collect anything. Everything flees from him. But a wise man knows how to save and how to invest in proper works and so forth. 21, he that followeth after righteousness and mercy findeth life, righteousness, and honor. If you seek those things, mercy is love, okay? If, if you seek to do and follow that that is right, and love finding life, that is to say eternal life, then righteousness and honor is going to be with you. Okay, 22, a wise man scaleth the city of the mighty and casteth down the strength of the confidence thereof. In other words, a wise man can overcome many things. Wisdom is a powerful, powerful tool. I can't help but think of 2 Samuel chapter 20. Uh, verse 16, where it was quite the other way around. It was a wise woman. But I, I, you're not going to have it, but I'm going to read it real quickly to you. Verse 16 of 2 Samuel 20. Joab, uh, David's been offended, and Joab's gone out to get revenge. He's going to wipe out a whole city. Then cried a wise woman out of the city, Hear, hear, say, I pray you unto Joab. Come near hither, and that I may speak with thee. And when he was come near unto her, the woman said, Art thou Joab? And he answered, I am he. Then she said unto him, Hear the words of thine handmaiden. And, be, and he answered, I do hear. I'm listening. And then she spake, saying, 
there, uh, there were wont to speak in old times, saying, They shall surely ask counsel of Abel, and so they ended the matter. In other words, a dispute should be discussed. 19, I am one of them that are peaceable and faithful in Israel. Thou seekest to destroy a city and a mother of Israel in Israel. Why wilt thou swallow up the inheritance of the Lord? Why are you going to do this? In other words, the, her wisdom is you only want one man. But there are a lot of innocents here, 20. And Joab answered and said, For be it, for be it from me that I should swallow up and or destroy. I mean, he was a gallant warrior. 21, the matter is not so, but a man of Mount Ephraim, Sheba, the son of uh, Bichai, by name, has lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. And the woman said unto Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown over to thee, uh, to thee over the wall. And then the woman went unto all the people in her wisdom, and they cut off the head of Sheba, the son of, uh, of uh, Bichri, and cast it out to Joab, and he blew a trumpet, and they retired from the city, every man to his tent, and Joab returned to Jerusalem. Wisdom of a woman saved the city. And so it is that wisdom is a nice company to travel with. Always remember that. 23, whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. If you don't have anything to say, you, and it's best to keep your mouth shut a lot of times. 24, proud and haughty scorners is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. In other words, a scoffer is his name. Anyone that scoffs at the word of God, that's what he is, is a scoffer. And that's, that's all he amounts to. 25, the desire of the slothful, that's to say a lazy person, killeth him, for his hands refuse to labor. Well, I'll get to it tomorrow, but tomorrow never comes. And again, I always reiterate, this does not have anything to do with handicapped people. Verse 26, He coveteth greedily all the day long, but the righteous giveth and spareth not. In other words, a, a, a greedy person is going to covet what they have all day, but a, a righteous person is willing to share, okay? And he does. 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is abomination. This is why God won't have it. Remember before in the, the verse concerning sacrifice? How much more when he bringeth it with a wicked mind. In other words, if you get religion for evil reasons, let, let's just let's take an analogy here. Let's say that if you live in a small town and the town basically is Christian, and you have a business there, and you say, well, if I, if I join the church and become a Christian, I, I will have a lot more customers. Okay? You don't want to do that. God would frown very much on you claiming to be something you're not. And um, uh, when God says it's an abomination, that's bad. In other words, it's very hard to retrieve anything from, uh, uh, from the evil that God finds abominable. So don't, don't claim to be something you're not. You're what you are, that's it. And if you ever join uh, and serve God, let it be because you love Him and you seek His blessings for honest reasons. 28, a false witness shall perish. But the man that heareth speaketh constantly. This, this loses a little in the translation. It says, what it says is a false witness is always going to perish. Those lies won't last. But a man that heareth, that means hears the word with understanding, speaketh constantly. No, he speaks evermore the truth is what it means in the Hebrew. He speaks evermore the truth. You can ride with him. You can trust him. Verse 29, a wicked man hardeneth his face, but as for the upright, he directeth his way. Meaning, meaning what? Instead of getting a big frown and thinking what he can do evil, the evil person, a, 
upright person thinks. That's what directeth means. He thinks. And you know, uh, I wonder how many people go through life and they never really think things through. You know, it's, it is so much better rather than just bouncing off into the deep is to consider a situation and take the knowledge that you have of, of knowing what a certain set of facts will add up to and subtract that that you know of a fact that's going to lose. Think it through and do it right and never, never, never leave God out of the equation. Always ask His approval and blessing and will. Always ask in God's will and you'll go much further, okay? <clears throat> a godly man or woman thinks. A godly child thinks. 30, there is no wisdom nor understanding nor counsel against the Lord. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means this. You know, I've, I've, a lot of people go against this. Why does God let the little children suffer? God shouldn't do that. I blame God for those little children suffering. Well, it just so happens in Deuteronomy 19 that if some clown nutcase rapes and murders a 13-year-old girl, God told you what to do about it to put a stop to it. He said, take him and strangle him stone him to death, execute him, get rid of him, whatever it takes, let the father throw the first stone, kill him and send him up here to me. And others will see and fear and these things will cease happening among you. Do we do that? No. Some, some no good can rape a 13 year old girl or whatever, a child, kill them, murder them and we hang on this trial, that trial, another trial, even though we may have two witnesses plus DNA, and we never quite get it done. Okay. So is it any wonder that... Uh, uh, so don't, don't blame God for our shortfallings, okay? Uh, verse 31 to complete. The horse is prepared against the day of battle but safety or victory is of the Lord. In other words, you stick to the Lord, you'll always be a winner. You have the war horse, have him all set, be ready, but in God, in God's way, we always have the victory. That sweet little lady in 2 Samuel chapter 20, beautiful town, beautiful people, wisdom, and God gave her the victory for communicating truth. Think about it. Wisdom is a beautiful thing. Personal character. Hey, how you doing? Think about it. All right. Bless your hearts. We'll stop there for today. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit moves, you've got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular denomination, reverend, or organization. Let's don't judge people. Let God do the judging and let us do the teaching. All right, let's study God's Word and let the chips fall wherever they may. Never, never, never apologize for the Word of God. See that you understand it with the proper translation and um, 
and uh, understanding. It's a fantastic thing to be in the graces of God. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Um, again, always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request. You don't need the number. You don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He sure does. And he loves you for that, okay? Uh, let him know that you do love him. Return that love. You'll always be glad you did because that's what he wants from you. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Grover from Arkansas. I've been a student of yours for 18 years, and I recall a lesson one time that had a word used which you said was the equivalent of the modern-day word as a title deed, which I checked out in the Strong Concordance and found to be true. I cannot recall the word, but it was pertaining to God giving someone instructions to write or record a document pertaining to the land he was giving uh, to the Israelites forever and was told to take it and either bury, hide, or some other way protect the document. I would be grateful, very grateful, if you would give me the scriptures where I can read it again. I've tried about every word I can think of to locate it by using the concordance, but I have not succeeded. Or you'll find it in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 10. And this is where he was told to write this uh, document, which was a deed, to Ashdod, which is the priest town there, and to bury it. And it's still there, and I still think it will be found. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 10, and it will answer your question for you. Michael from Oklahoma. My church is threatening to kick me out of it if I let my hair grow long. Please, if you can find the time, answer me with your view on this. Um, well, naturally, I'm not going to mention the name of your church, but, uh, of course, my preference is not long hair, okay, because most old combat Marines would, uh, or, or soldiers would let you know why you would not want long hair, okay? Um, but if you choose to have it, this, it's not, uh, there's not a sin biblically for that. But um, if you grow unhappy in a church where you are, then... Um, you might be better off. God might be dealing with you in some other way other than hair to get you out of that particular group. I don't know. You have to decide that. Everyone must choose and follow God's plan because I believe what I teach. I believe God places us where he wishes us, okay? Especially God's elect. Jeremy from um, Michigan, I believe this is. It could be Mississippi, but I'm going to say Michigan. Pastor Murray, I'm 25 years old and I'm a saved Christian, but for years now I have been away from God. Three months ago I found you on television in the morning and you have brought me back to God. I look forward to hearing you speak every morning. My question is, how do I repent for the years I was led astray and became closer to God? For it is heavy on my heart to not just study, but to teach. The, his word. Well, all you do is repent. And if you want to teach, then you got to study real hard because you don't have anything to teach until you're familiar with God's word. You know, many times you've heard me, probably heard me say that uh, uh, God does call the teachers. They're, they see a big GP up in the sky and they think it means go preach and it means go plow, okay, for some people. So, it's, it's real simple. When you've studied God's Word to the point, whether you have had assistance through a seminary or whatever the case may be, a good teacher, then when people come to you and seek you out because you answer questions and document them from the Word of God, then you're beginning to be ready. But all you got to do is repent. God loves you, and I'm so glad that you're back with Him. You're 25, you couldn't have had too many years away from him, okay? You just repent and get in there and get those traces tight and work, okay? God loves a worker. Jeannie from California. 
Do mountains mean government or hills uh, mean smaller or local governments? Well, it, it means nations actually most often. Uh, and uh, nations it is with the hills being smaller countries. But you could consider it uh, the same way. Bev from Pennsylvania. What does the Bible say about our parents being taken care of by others when I could do it myself? I know it's hard to do. I took care of my husband's mother at home until she passed away. Well, uh, you know, you, it's your choice, okay? Now, as long as you can give, as long as you can give the help and the nursing that they need, there are times when people need 24-hour-a-day care. And it's pretty hard on a family to do that, okay? And so I don't I never feel guilty if you have to have a home where people have 24-hour-a-day care. But it's admirable of you to want to take care of her yourself if you're able to do that, and you can do it, okay? You don't have to apologize for it. She's your mom. That's what she wants to do then do it by all means. Mike from Oklahoma. Um, I am a disabled non a vet, a Vietnam veteran, 100% disabled. I've been attending a church who basically says, if you don't tithe, you're robbing God. Is this true? Am I robbing God to live on a fixed income? Also, I was told God's not answering my prayers stemming from tithing. Well, that you know, when you're on a fixed income and when you're disabled, um, then when you pay your bills, you don't you only tithe on 10 percent that you have over. Uh, in, in the case of disability, I'm going to say that again because there'll be many people not understand. This, this has to do with a person that is disabled in my opinion, okay? as a student, an educated student of God's Word, is that when a person who is on a fixed income and disabled, after you pay for your medicine, pay your payments for your home, your food, and taxes, then what you have left over, if you want to tithe on a tenth of that, fine. But I know in most cases, none of you have any left over. And, and you can tie on that, it's zero. And 10% of zero is zero, okay? I don't care what that church is telling you. If you don't have it, you don't have it. Um, I, you know, I, I think a church that is all they think about is money rather than teaching God's Word, because if more churches would teach God's Word, they wouldn't have to worry about forcing preaching to people, especially handicapped people, that you've got to tithe and God's not answering your prayers because that, my friend, is a lie. That church lied to you. They certainly did. Because being a handicapped person, God hears your prayers. And you keep talking to him, all right? Daryl from Texas. What are the levels of sin, such as stealing a pair of pants from a department store, than murder? M murder causes loss of family, grief, and human destruction. Well, it causes more than that. You're supposed to be executed. God demands capital punishment. If you murder, he de that, that's to say if you lie in wait. This doesn't have anything to do with the crime of passion or an accidental death. But um, so naturally, uh, for the murder, you pay with your life, according to God's plan. Deuteronomy chapter 19, Numbers chapter 35, okay? Whereas with a pair of pants, you just repay four times uh, or whatever the case may be. And um, uh, stop doing it, all right? Repent of it. Um, this is who? Elistine from North Carolina. Will you give me some understanding about 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8. Thank you. Please send me the mark of the beast, okay? Um, love, that which is, um, is charity, love covers a multitude of sins. Meaning, love is, is the number one thing with our Father, is loving His children, okay? 
communicating, getting along, utilizing wisdom, then we all fall short and we all have sins in one form or the other. And what that verse means is that is if you're trying and, and, and um, you're practicing um, uh, these charitable acts among God's children, that covers a multitude of sins. They're erased because of it, okay? Uh, Ruby from New York. I love, I love your teaching, but I miss communion. What could I do? Can I get a local church just communion, one that is pretty good? Well, well you can if you want to, but how often did Jesus say to take Holy Communion? He said, as often as you meet. How often did they meet? Three times, Passover, Pentecost, and Feast of Tabernacles, okay? And they were to take it on those occasions. I do not believe that you should take communion every day, okay? Because I think it gets to be a ritual then, and it's too precious for that. But you can take, we give Holy Communion when those times come by on television and encourage you to take it with us. You do not have to have a church to take communion. You can take it yourself. All you have to do is repeat what the, that the bread is the body of Christ, okay? His body took the stripes, we get the healing. And thank our Father, just put it out there like it is. Thank you, Father, for this gift and partake of the bread. In the same way with the wine or whatever you choose to substitute his blood, which forgives sins and washes it away. When you're ill and you need a healing, you can take it yourself or any Christian can give communion. I know there are a lot of churches would not approve of that, but God does. And you know what? He's the one that counts. But we, we take it three times a year right here on television. Hang around. Jeannie from, G. Annie from, um, and Michael, where, where are you from? I don't see where you're from, so I'll just keep going, okay? Um, what do you think of the violent weather around the world, and does this fit into prophecy? All things fit into prophecy. Read, read the first few verses of Mark chapter 13 concerning earthquakes in diverse places and so forth. Uh, it's happening, okay? And, and we are coming down. We are in that generation. And uh, they're going to increase, okay. C Cecilia from Georgia. Where is the verse in the Bible that says you will know your loved ones in heaven? Well, the millennium chapters in Ezekiel from chapter 40 to the end. And it stipulates very clearly in Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 20 through 25, <clears throat> that if you are one of God's elect, the word is the dock in the Hebrew tongue, um, then you can go to your mother, brother, sister, father, meaning you have to recognize them or you wouldn't know who that was in the spiritual body because we're all in spiritual bodies at that time. Ezekiel chapter 44, along about verse 20, began reading. Melvin from Louisiana. Were there two Adams? Genesis says Cain went into the land of Nod and got a wife. It seems though there had to be other people on earth besides Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. I'm a little confused about this. Well, after they were driven from the Garden. But yes, there were two Adams. There was Adam and there was Eth ha Adam. Okay. Two, and and um, all the races were created on the sixth day. And Cain went to the land of Nod and took one of those for wife. Okay. So you are correct. Those of you, the, the Hebrew manuscripts are very specific in this and very clear. Um, next time we teach it um, on television, be sure and catch it or order the videotapes of the first six chapters and you will learn to use the Hebrew yourself to document that. Michael from Pennsylvania. What was the thorn that was in Paul's side? Uh, no, no one knows of a certainty, but um, I can g give you my educated guess. Now, I've used that term twice today, but be that as it may. It was his eyesight, because he, Luke and many others were his, a few others, were his scribe. He did not do his own scribeship. Once he would sign off and said, you know it's me signing off because of the very large print. He couldn't see real good, okay? 
then God did blind him on the way to Damascus, but uh, he could his sight, part of his sight was given back. Uh, Marinka, Mor, Morinica from Tennessee, 15 years old. If you did something wrong and asked Jesus for forgiveness, how would you know if he forgave you? I've been told I am a chosen one. What does that mean? Well, Jesus is going to forgive you if you are repenting. That means if you are sorry you did that and you're asking his forgiveness, he's going to forgive you. You don't even have to question it. And do you know something? Um, um, he doesn't even want to hear about it again. And a chosen one is simply uh, if, if chosen before the foundations of the earth is what God's elect are. They're not any better than anybody else, but they have special things to do. And much of the word is written to them. Uh, one of the favorite chapters uh, you'll read concerning God's election is Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 26. How God intervenes in their lives at times. Tim from, or Tom from Kentucky. At what age should I have my children baptized? Tom, uh, your children have to make their own mind up when they wish to be baptized. It's a personal thing between them and the Lord Jesus Christ, not you. Okay. Now, it is true that as, as their father, you have the right to give their, your approval. But different children become of age at different uh, uh, at the age of accountability at different ages by year. So you just have to let them decide. When they know and understand what baptism is about, and they desire to be baptized, then it's time, okay? I've known a lot of people 60 years old that weren't at the age of accountability yet. So, uh, you know, you just, uh, but the main thing is, I, I want you to understand this, you're their father, but they're the ones that must decide. God won't account it if you say, ah, today's the day you are going to be baptized. God won't accept that, okay? They have to want to. They have to decide to. Um, sorry, old timer, that's the way it goes. Uh, there are certain things that our children have to grow up to do. Sarah from Tennessee. I listen to your Bible study every morning and I really like to hear you explain the Word of God. Well, thank you. I have a question. I read a lot in the Bible where angels don't have wings, but then I read where God does have wings. Could you explain this to me? I really don't know what to think of this. Well, we'll... We'll have a go at it. Christ was made in the image of God perfectly. If you've seen Christ, you've seen the Father. Did Christ have wings? Of course not. So God doesn't have wings. However, where the confusion comes in is there were certain vehicles with God's throne aboard in Ezekiel chapter 1 that appeared on earth. And Ezekiel trying to explain why they were up in the air had to say they had wings. They were flying, okay? But, um, uh, and, um, but they were circular, and they looked not where they went, okay? So that, uh, they, man, angel, have never, never had wings. Um, archangels have never had wings. Cherubims have never had wings. We were all made in the image of God and the uh, sons of God in heaven. Debbie from Texas. A question for you, a thought or was always, I was always taught that if you ask God to bless your food that uh, he would uh, do this, does he? Well, he, you know, you should always ask, but also um, as it is written, um, as it is written, you are to ask the blessing, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, on things that God created to be received. And, you know, if you want to be healthy, you've got to stick with that, okay? Uh, so you've got to go by God's health laws. Many people think that in Acts chapter 10, he weighed everything and said it would be fantastic to go ahead. Don't, all he was talking about was mankind, not, not unclean animals, that you should not call a Gentile common. If they are a Christian, they're a Christian. Jeffrey from Pennsylvania. Uh, I would like to know where in the Bible is the 
conception of Jesus Christ and also where in the Bible is the birth of Jesus Christ. Well, I, I think one of the better accounts, it's more than one place, but I think one of the better accounts is Luke chapter 1. Because if you understand what Abiah, the course of Abiah, it even dates the birth of Christ. Uh, and, but the, you will find the conception and birth there in Luke chapter 1. Brenda from Maryland. Um, Brenda, you did what was right. You you hang you hang tough. Uh, you you know you you are a, a disabled person. Doesn't have to, I mean you can't work, okay? And uh, you're handicapped. Uh, you see, this is why sometimes uh, when when the Bible speaks of slothfulness, that's to say lazy people. Sometimes handicapped people get put on a guilt trip from that, and you shouldn't. You shouldn't at all. Um, there's um, God expects that this is why we have uh, Social Security. This is why we have Medicare, Medicaid, and other for diabetics and things of that nature. And there comes a time like um, where you're losing your sight that you're not going to be able to work, and, and that's certainly not being lazy. And... Um, so don't, don't let the fact that an able-bodied person is lazy have anything to do with a handicapped person being unable to hold a job, okay, period. You're doing good. Okay, hey, I'm out of time. You know what? I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter, verse by verse. But most of all, God loves you for it. You know what? You make his day. When you make his day, he's going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, blessing God again, he always blesses you. But most important, this, hey, you listen to me. You stay in his word every day. In his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel. Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.